Hello again, everybody. So um, what I'm going to do this afternoon um, is uh, finish up the material that we didn't get through uh, this week in class. I'll do this every week when we run out of time. Sometimes it won't happen, sometimes it will. Um, so what I will do is I'll finish going through my slides. I will mark them up like I've been doing during class. And I will uh, go through the questions and uh, show you some strategies with those again and just review some of that stuff. And um, as well, I'll do is when the questions come up, I'll, I'll pause for maybe one to two seconds so that you can uh, stop the video and then you can take a, a look at the question and think about it. And if you've got friends around, chat with those, uh, chat with them, sorry. And, um, and then we will move on and I'll uh, work through the answer if I need to. Uh, so uh, that's what we're going to do. Um, I will disappear in a moment because I cannot record my uh, my visage. My camera doesn't work when I've got my iPad connected. So um, it will be just my iPad and I will disappear and you'll just have my, uh, my dulcet tones to accompany the slides. Okay, so we'll start up uh, right away here. Okay, so um, let's start up with this last question that we that we looked at. Um, I'll just run through this quickly because uh, a lot of people are packing up. And so the question was, how much difference is there in the concentration of protons when comparing pH 8 and pH 11? So as what we'd said is we've got pH 8 and we go up to pH 9 and then up to pH 10 and then pH 11. Hopefully you remember that when you go from 8 to 9, that's a 10-fold increase. And then from 9 to 10, it's another 10-fold increase. And 10 to 11 is another 10-fold increase. And when you go up these log orders like this, 10 times 10 times 10 is 1,000. So with this question, you, you prephrase this answer, and, and then you check for the answer. And so you're going down, that's wrong, that's wrong, that's wrong, that's wrong, that's the correct answer. So that's how you'd approach that one. So one of the, 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 the more complicated topics that, that we're going to finish up here with is looking at um, the relationship between the proton hydrogen ion concentration and what is called the hydroxide ion concentration. One of the easiest ways to understand the, the nature of the relationship between these two um, these two concentrations is to uh, to explain why it is. Um, that pure water has a pH of seven. So, is what we have is um, over on the on the kind of left here is we've got a we've got a water molecule, and uh, with its oxygen and its oxygen there and its two hydrogens, and so um, uh, we can use this uh, this this water molecule model to explain why you have. A, um, a pH of seven. So is what happens is in pure water, with a, a certain frequency, a very low frequency, this water molecule will actually break apart, and so it will it will spontaneously just break up, and it breaks up into uh, an OH and an H plus. And so is what happens is when it breaks up, the OH steals the electron. From the proton, and so the proton, or the hydrogen, and so the hydrogen becomes H plus, and the other piece becomes an OH. So what happens is this piece here will break away from. Um, uh, let's see what would be a good color for this. Uh, no, green breaks away from this piece here, and so that's what gives us the OH and the H. And when the OH breaks away from the H, it takes a an electron from the H, and we end up with. OH minus and H plus. And so um, in pure water, uh, this happens with the frequency such that one in every 10 million water molecules will actually break apart. And so is what that means is that we end up with uh, a different color pen, is that we end up with a concentration of protons in pure water of 10 to the minus 7 molar because it's every one in 10 million um, protons which, uh, or in 10 million water molecules which dissociate and so that gives us a concentration of protons 10 to the minus 7. So if you think about one water molecule breaking up into two parts, if we have the, the proton, this part here, that is going to end up being 10 to the minus 7 molar. Um, this other piece here must end up having exactly the same concentration. So this 
ends up being 10 to the 7 uh, 10 to the minus 7 molar 2 so so that's this kind of whole piece here okay so when this water molecule breaks up we get the same number of 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 pieces of this on the right of the OH as we do the H over here. So they're in equal concentrations, and that concentration is 10 to the minus 7 molar. Okay, so that becomes important in understanding the relationship between the proton concentration and the hydroxyl concentration. So as what you see is in pure water, the hydroxyl ion concentration, uh, 10 to the minus 7 molar, OH minus, is exactly the same as the proton concentration of uh, um, of the other part. And so those two things equal. So um, if we think about uh, uh, what the product of those concentrations is, the concentration of the hydroxide ion, the OH piece, uh, multiplied by the concentration of the protons equals 10 to the minus 14 molar. So let's just drop in for pure water 10 to the minus 7 molar and 10 to the minus 7 molar um, for protons. So remember this is at pH 7, this is pure water. So with pure water at pH 7, the concentration of the hydroxyl ions is 10 to the minus 7 molar, the concentration of the protons is 10 to the minus 7 molar um, for the reasons that I've just explained. And so if you multiply those together, that gives you a total concentration of 10 to the minus 14 molar. So if you are multiplying logs, if we're multiplying logs, is what we actually do there is we add them together. And that's how you manage um, uh, the multiplication of logs, uh, of the exponents there. Uh, so um, if you don't understand that and can't follow it, that's the kind of thing we do in co-curriculum. So um, this establishes a rule for us that the concentration of the hydroxyl ions, hydroxide ions multiplied by the concentration of the protons equals 10 to the minus 14 molar, and that is true for every single pH. It, if we go to pH, if we go to pH 2, let's see what happens at pH 2, for example. So at pH 2, the proton concentration, remember, will be 10 to the minus 2 molar, and if, you, if that doesn't make sense, go back to the, to the class lessons and, 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 and review that. And so the concentration of the protons times the hydroxyl at any pH is always 10 to the minus 14 molar. So the question is, uh, what do I have to multiply 10 to the minus 2 by to get 10 to the minus 14? So some people will see this intuitively, and some people will, will not see it intuitively and have to do a mathematical rearrangement. So um, for, for some people, they will, they will just see this and they will say, well, um, if I've got to add these exponents together, then this must be 10 to the minus 12. 10 to the minus 12 times 10 to the minus 2 is 10 to the minus 14. And so just like we did up here, we're adding these two exponents together uh, to give us 10 to the minus 14. Other people will have to do an algebraic rearrangement, and so let's just see what, what that rearrangement would look like. So let's um, let's go back to our starting equation and do a rearrangement. So um, if I wanted to try and calculate this here, so I'm trying to isolate that, then what I'm going to do is I'm going to divide both sides by the proton concentration. Okay, and that basically is going to eliminate that from there. And I've got to divide this side by the proton concentration too. So um, uh, Remember what we just said is that we're looking for this question mark, which is the hydroxide ion concentration. We said that the proton concentration was 10 to the minus 2 molar, and we said that the water was always must equal 10 to the minus 14 molar. So if we do that rearrangement we just talked about, then we've got to divide 10 to the minus 14 by 10 to the minus 2. If you do that, and you calculate it, it's 10 to the minus 12, which gives you that answer there. So again, that's, that, that's simply... The kind of algebraic rearrangement we talked about um, earlier in this earlier in the week when I just said, okay, if you have this kind of algebraic formula, you should be able to rearrange it. And a lot of people nodded um, and were agreement that that's pretty easy. And so that is just the application of that rearrangement to to a to a um, biochemical problem. Um, so if if that doesn't make sense, then we can hit that in in co curriculum. So is what this equation lets us do is um, 
It is solve for hydroxyl ion concentration if we know what the proton concentration is. So that's, that's really helpful. And the other thing it lets us do is it lets us uh, solve for the proton concentration if we know the hydroxyl ion concentration. And we can, we can do that because this is always going to be 10 to the minus 14. So as long as you know one of the hydroxyl ion concentration or the proton concentration, you can solve for the single thing that you do not know. So let's just do uh, another one very quickly. Let's just say that, um, let's say that the, um, uh, let's say the hydroxyl ion concentration is 10 to the minus nine, and you wanna know what the proton concentration is, and don't forget that equals 10 to the minus 14 molar. So all we're gonna do is divide, um, don't divide both sides here by 10 to the minus nine, so that then cancels that out and isolates the unknown. Divide this side by 10 to the minus nine. The units cancel out, obviously. And remember, when you're when you're multiplying logs, you divide. Uh, you multiplying logs, you add them together, or exponents, you add them together. And when you are dividing exponents, you subtract them. So uh, this is going to end up being 10 to the minus five molar. And remember, that is our unknown proton concentration. So then, if I said to you, okay, um, uh, what is the pH? You would say, well. That's easy, the pH is, is 5. Okay, remember pH is the negative log of the proton concentration, so the pH is the negative log of the proton concentration. And so if we plug in um, our proton concentration from down here, up here, is what we end up with is uh, the pH equals the negative log of, let's just substitute that in here, negative log of 10 to the minus 5 molar, and so the log of 10 to the minus 5, um, we end up with minus minus 5, which is the same as positive 5, which is a pH of 5. Okay, so you can go all the way from, from knowing the hydroxide ion concentration to telling me from that what the pH is, okay? Those are the kind of problems you're going to get on, 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 on your quiz. So we can do all kinds of things at this point. We can, we can calculate the, 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 the proton concentration from the pH, the pH from the proton concentration. We can calculate the concentration of protons if we are given the hydroxyl ion concentration. We can calculate the pH from the hydroxyl ion concentration as well. So again, uh, if you need some help with the algebra there, um, make sure you come and ask for help. We can, we can help you figure this stuff out. Uh, as long as you come and talk to us. So let's kind of um, take a quick look at this question. I'll pause for a second or two to let you have a look at it. When I pause, I'd recommend that you stop the video so you can think about it. Okay, so let's read this through. Um, this is very much like the, 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 one of the questions we had earlier. Uh, we've got this pit, the Berkeley pit again, and it's a disused copper mine. Uh, where is it? It's just outside Butte, Montana. And again, we've got this volume. So remember before, is what we said is um, is that you uh, you don't really need to know that. So maybe we can ignore all this. It doesn't contain any information that we need. But here is the pertinent information. It's a pH of two. And you're being asked now, what is the hydroxyl ion concentration? So um, what do we need to know to get the hydroxyl ion concentration? Uh, if we're going to get back to the hydroxyl ion concentration, is what we need to start with is to find out what the proton concentration is. And so is what we've got to do is ask ourselves, okay, if the pH equals 2, what does that mean for the proton concentration? And so remember that um, the proton concentration is, uh, is equal to 10 to the negative of the pH. Um, and some of you will have to use that formula, and uh, some of you will be perfectly able to just see that if the pH is two, then the proton concentration equals 10 to the minus two molar. So once we've got that number, remember that's the proton concentration, is what we need to do then is work out the, the, the hydroxide ion concentration. And so for that, we have to go back to thinking about how the hydroxide ion concentration multiplied by the proton concentration equals 10 to the minus 14 molar. Well, this is pretty lucky because we've got the proton concentration. So what we end up with is the hydroxide ion concentration times 10 to the minus 2 
equals 10 to the minus 14. Now some of you will immediately see that this must be 10 to the minus 12 molar. Some of you will just see that because you work out what you must add to the exponent of minus 2 to get the exponent minus 14. So some of you will, will figure that out really quickly. Others will say to yourself, I've got to do the algebraic rearrangement. And so you would do 10 to the minus 14 divided by 10 to the minus 2 on your calculator, and that comes out 10 to the minus 12. And remember, we're looking for a concentration, so we've got to have the units. So that whole mental process shouldn't take you more than a minute and a half. Once you've got this down, a minute and a half. Um, when you're studying and practicing, to start with, it might take you five minutes. But as you do more and more problems and you drill more and more of these, you will start to get them quicker and quicker and quicker. You'll just start to see the relationships between, between pH and proton concentration, proton concentration and hydroxide ion concentration, and it will start to come much quicker. So we've got a good prephrase of the answer here, and so we're just going to try and look for it. Okay, here is a good 10 to the minus 12 um, molar for the hydroxide ion concentration. So off we go with those and we bubble in or we pick 10 to the minus 12 as the correct answer. Okay, so I will give you problems to, uh, to, to work on for this and uh, that will give you the opportunity to practice and get faster and faster. Let's now uh, take a a, uh, a look at a biological exam a biological example of, of why all this stuff uh, understanding this stuff is is important um, we're going to look at uh, the role of buffers now in in regulating proton concentrations and so we've talked a lot about pH and calculating protons so now we're going to look at um, what buffers do and buffers do one basic thing if you excuse the pun with the basic part now. Um, uh, Buffers basically regulate the proton concentration. So they're a way of regulating pH at the end of the day. So let's look at an example here. And the example we're going to use is a, um, a I don't want to call it a disease because it's not necessarily a disease. Um, it's, a, it's a metabolic imbalance, let's call it that, called ketoacidosis. So when you break this down, we've got the word keto, and that's going to be derived from uh, ketones or keto acids. And then uh, we've got the acid part here. So this tells you this is something to do with um, with, with pH imbalance, and, uh, and it's going to be something to do with these these keto things, and we'll talk about what those keto things are in a moment. So um, those ketone thing, those keto things, this part of the word keto refers to these things called ketone bodies. So these ketone bodies um, uh, can be released into the blood. Uh, your body can do it naturally, or when you put certain things in your body, you will see an increase in the concentration of ketone bodies. So if you add more of these ketone bodies uh, to your blood, then their concentration in them goes up. And, um, and uh, these ketone bodies are acidic. And an acid is any substance which, if you put it in water, it will dissociate and it will release at least one proton. So um, if we look at, for example, hydrochloric acid, HCl, uh, if you put HCl into water, it will dissociate into a proton, H+, and a chlorine ion, Cl-. And so this bit is positively charged, and because it has lost one of its electrons back to, chl uh, to, to chlorine, so chlorine's got a complete negative charge from that electron it took. So there's an example of an acid. Um, so acids increase the proton concentration. So think, let's think about what that means for a moment. You always got to push this information back up against other information and ask yourself, okay, I can memorize that, but what does it actually mean? What is the meaning? What do I have to understand from this? So what is happening here? If, if, if these ketone bodies get uh, reach higher concentrations in the blood and they dissociate so that the proton concentration goes up, the consequence of that is that the pH is going to drop. So if your blood pH is meant to be at 7.4 and we start dumping ketone bodies into the blood, then this number is going to drop because the proton concentration is going up. Remember that as proton concentration goes up, the pH 
we drop down the scale, we get to a lower number. So even if this only goes down from 7.4 to 7.1, you look at that and you say, well, that's not much. But but remember that if we go from uh, if we go from um, eight down to seven, that's a tenfold change. So even this small small shift here is a significant change in the concentration. And your cells um, circulating in your blood can't cope with dramatic changes in the proton concentration. Those protons react with other molecules, they change the shape of proteins, um, they cause all kinds of problems. So, so what we're going to do is find a way of getting that pH back towards 7.4. And then similarly, you can, you, can have, you can have the opposite of this phenomenon, where the blood pH goes from, let's say, 7.4 to 7.4. Seven, and is what we've got to do then is we've got to find a mechanism to push it back to 7.4. But we're going to focus on this phenomenon, this, this acidosis, where your blood pH drops uh, from 7.4 to say 7.1, and then the buffer is going to push that back. Okay, that's where the buffer is going to work here for us to push it back. So, um, so let's just kind of review that really, really quickly with a question. So, as the ketone body concentration goes up. So what we're going to do is we're going to release ketone bodies into the blood. And so what happens there? Well, the ketone body is going to release protons. And so that means that the concentration of protons in the blood, remember the blood volume is not going to change. So we've got a certain, let's just say this is the amount of blood in your body. Obviously, it's just a metaphor. That's the amount of blood in your body and it's got you know, this many protons in it to start with and then we start dumping in those ketone bodies and they release many more protons and so the pH is just doing what as the proton concentration increases well the blood pH is going to drop it's going to go down so um, that's kind of the answer for the, for the kind of question given the context of what we're talking about now is what will actually happen is that is that after the blood pH drops it's going to go back, and so your body's going to work to push it back to being the same. But the immediate effect on the blood is that the pH is going to drop. It's going to go from like 7.4 to 7.2. And then as soon as your body senses that shift, it's going to push it back up. But you don't want to think about this phenomena. If we think about, okay, if we think about this as, as pH, so this axis is pH, we think about this axis down here as time. If we think about what your blood pH is doing over time, it's not doing this. It's actually fluctuating around that as an average. And so it's undergoing these small fluctuations. As the blood pH drops, the buffer kicks in and pushes it back up again. And if it goes a little bit too high, the blood buffering system pushes back in and pushes it back down again. And so if we look to this, with very fine resolution is what we would see in these these very very small fluctuations around a steady stable state um, but there are these oscillations as it were very very small so the function of the blood buffering system is to restore pH and so if we see the pH go from 7.4 and we see it drop down to 7.2 the blood buffering system is going to say yeah that's not good let's push it back up to 7.4 so is what you can start thinking about is, is how the blood buffering system might do that. So if we're going from 7.4 to 7.2, is what that means is the proton concentration is going up. Yeah. So if we want to push it back towards 7.4 from 7.2, is what we've got to do is find some way of getting that proton concentration back down to the corresponding concentration we see at at pH 7.4. So that's what the blood buffering system has to do, and it works the same in reverse. So uh, as what we're saying here is that if the pH drops, that means that means if the pH goes from 7.4 down to 7.2, if the, if the pH drops because the proton concentration is increasing, then um, <coughs> then the blood buffering system uh, kicks in and, and we see um, we see 
the, the pH being pushed back up. Now, if the pH goes up, so let's say we've got the opposite problem from ketoacidosis and we go from 7.4 to 7.7, .7, let's say, if we see the pH going up, then the blood buffering system is going to work to push us back down again. So 7.4 to 7.7, .7, the proton concentration here is dropping. And so the blood buffering system working over here to push the pH back to 7.4 is going to try and have to get the concentration of the protons um, uh, back up again to push the pH down. So if you think about, um, if we think about, let's go from, let's go from 7.4 down to 7.2 and up to 7.7. .7. If we think about uh, fluctuation around that range, here the proton concentration is dropping, right? But in this range, going going down the pH scale, the proton concentration is going up. So if the blood buffering system wants to push the pH back from 7.2 to 7.4, going in that direction is what the blood buffering system has to do, is drop the proton concentration down, and if we want the blood buffering system to push the pH down because it's um, up, sorry, because it's 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 uh, it's it's started to shift the other way, then we've got to take the proton concentration and we've got to push it, um, we've got to push it uh, higher. So um, that's fundamentally what the blood buffering system is going to do. So here is the here is the chemistry behind the blood buffering system. Uh, it fundamentally involves um, these five, I don't want to say molecules because some of them are molecules, but uh, it involves these five things. We've got carbon dioxide, which is a molecule, water is a molecule you're familiar with, carbonic acid, which you've not met before, proton, which is not a molecule, it's just an ion, it's a, remember it's a hydrogen that's lost its electron, and we've got this molecule here called bicarbonate. So um, what is happening in this system um, is basically revolving around this molecule here, which is called carbonic acid. So that's an acid. So um, is what it's going to have a tendency to do is release protons. But um, once it's released protons, it takes on the form, it releases protons here, and so that pushes the proton concentration up and lowers the pH. Now, when you take protons off of carbonic acid, and we basically take these one of these protons, one of these hydrogens away and form a proton from it, you end up with this molecule here called bicarbonate. And so bicarbonate acts as a base. And so what a base can do is it can absorb pro protons. And so that bicarbonate can absorb, you've got a bunch of bicarbonate, that bicarbonate can absorb protons. And that causes the proton concentration to drop. And of course that means that the pH is going to go up. So if we have a system where, where um, we are causing the carbonic acid to break apart, we say that's dissociating, the carbonic acid dissociates, then, then the proton concentration will go up and the pH will go down. Um, on the other hand, if we create a lot of bicarbonate, and you can produce this in your body and it can be pushed into your bloodstream, um, it can also be injected into your bloodstream, bloodstream to lower, uh, lower the proton concentration and raise the blood pH. If we dump a bunch of bicarbonate into this chemical system um, is what will happen is it will absorb a bunch of protons and it will become this molecule again. And the other thing that the carbonic acid can do is rather than separating, rather than splitting into a proton and the bicarbonate, um, it can it can it can separate into a molecule of carbon dioxide and a molecule of water. So depending on, on whether the, the carbonic acid splits into the CO2 in the water, whether it splits into the, hydro, the proton and the bicarbonate, we can either raise or lower the proton concentration. So the question that then we have to address is, well, what causes it to go one way or the other? And so the answer to that question is, um, is basically 
the relative concentrations of the carbon dioxide and the water and the relative concentration of the protons. And of course, the relative concentration of the protons is going to be, the, is going to be the determinant of pH. So at some pHs, if you have a high concentration of protons, so if we've got too many protons, this chemical reaction is going to be driven in this direction. And it can be driven in this direction because this arrow and this arrow is bidirectional. So it can go all the way from the right to the left, all the way from the left to the right. So if we've got too much pH, let's say we're at pH 7.2, and we've got to get back up to pH 7.4, is what we've got to do there, remember, is remove some of these protons. So these protons, they will associate with bicarbonate. You can release bicarbonate into your blood, and it's circulating in general anyway. And so think about the bicarbonate, if you like, as a sponge. And so when that happens, the carbonic acid forms, and because we're driving the reaction from right to left, because these things over here on the right are in higher concentrations than the carbonic acid, we push the reaction all the way to the left, and then what happens is the carbonic acid separates into carbon dioxide and water. And then what happens to carbon dioxide? That's what you exhale. So you exhale that. So that contributes to what you're breathing out. So on the other hand, um, if we need to push the pH um, lower, so if we've got the pH up at 7.7 .7 and we've got to push it back to 7.4, in that case we need to release protons, let's clear these markings and start over. Um, if we've got to go from 7.7 from, uh, from .7 to 7.4, that means we need to increase the proton concentration. And so how do we do that? We basically form carbonic acid and we have too few protons. Okay, so there's too few. We, sh we need more. There's not enough. And you can think about that as pulling the reaction over towards the right-hand side. And so what happens is any carbonic acid will dissociate into the protons and the, car uh, and the bicarbonate. And so the protons then are going to concentra uh, contribute to increasing the proton concentration and pushing the pH back down again. Now, if it starts to swing too much in the other way, what do you do? You release some bicarbonate into your bloodstream. That associates with the protons. And because this is now in too high a concentration, we push ourselves all the way back over to the left. That's what gives us this fluctuation. This is constant back and forth. That's what these arrows mean. That means this reaction will go backwards and forwards and backwards and forwards um, until ideally it's at an equilibrium. And I'm talking about a chemical equilibrium here, not really a homeostatic equilibrium. The equilibrium that it may reach may be um, favoring one side of the reaction or the other. So equilibrium, that doesn't mean that one side equals the other side. Um, that's not what we're talking about here. So um, that's kind of what the blood buffering system is doing. So let's just summarize that more neatly than my drawings. So if the pH is too low, we've got too much of the protons. And so the bicarbonate is released into the bloodstream and that concentration, this high concentration of these things drives the reaction to the left and the carbonic acid dissociates into carbon dioxide and water. That's the pH is too low, remember. That means we've got a high proton concentration. So then what about if the pH is too high? If the pH is too high, we don't have enough of the protons. And so in that case, the carbonic acid, which is just going to form from circulating carbon dioxide and water, is going to be dissociated. And that will release protons and some bicarbonate. And of course, then um, the proton concentration will go up and the pH will go down. This is very, very difficult to memorize, obviously. And so you really have to understand the principles here. And you can certainly memorize the equations. But if someone asks you to explain this, you can explain it in words, with diagrams, with the equations. Um, so that can be uh, a bit of a challenge. But that's the biological application of all this stuff that we've been talking about. You notice we're talking about the language of, we're talking in the language of concentrations, of pH. Um, we could have the same concentration, the same discussion in terms of molarity. So here's another question. I'll pause for a second or two. Okay, so the situation is here. We've got an alcoholic admitted to the ER. 
And serious episodes of alcoholism can lead to too much of excesses, just too much of these ketone bodies in the blood. Um, and so in this situation, what's going to happen in the alcoholic's blood? So um, this is one of the times when if you don't understand what all this means, there's just no point. Looking at the answers will not suddenly give you insight into, into what all this means. So um, is what we've got happening here is that uh, we've got um, a serious episode of alcoholism and, and that leads to this excess of ketone bodies in the blood. So let's just say that the, 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 the ketone body KB concentration goes up. Now remember these are these are acids and so is what they do is as the concentration grows up the proton concentration in the blood increases. Okay so that's the first consequence there and then obviously what that means is that the pH drops. So is what we got to do uh, is what homeostasis has to do is what your body has to do um, is it's got to try and get the pH back up again. And so how are we going to do that is what we've got to do therefore is we've, we've got to remove protons. We've got to lower the concentration of protons to get the pH back up again. So what's going to happen there is initially the blood pH is going to drop. So let's take a look at our answers and see if we can make any progress on the answers based on that much information. Let's not try and work out too much stuff. Let's see if we can kind of eliminate some stuff, what we have. So the first thing that's going to happen is the blood pH is going to drop. So I've got blood pH will initially rise. So that's no good. So let's eliminate that one. And we've got blood pH will initially drop. So that that matches what we've got going on there. So that's a good thing. So let's keep B. Let's just put a squiggle, a little tick by it. Blood pH will initially drop, so that's that's the same thing. That's kind of that's good. That matches up, and so then we've got D. Blood pH will initially rise. Well, again, that's the same as the first one, so so that one's got to go. So then a B and C. So okay, that's better. That's a one in two chance of guessing rather than one in four. So let's keep working out what's going on and uh, and then see um and see what 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 happens when we when we keep keep going with this train of thought. So the pH is, is too low, we've got to get the pH up. So to get the pH up, we've got to remove protons from solution. So we remove the protons from solution. How do we do that, remember? Well, that means we've got to increase the concentration of HCO3 minus. And so they will associate with these excess protons. So these two things will combine, and that's going to produce that H2 CO3, that carbonic acid. Remember, then that's going to dissociate into CO2 and, and water. So uh, is what we got happening then is that we've got to have an answer that's going to, going to have something to do with bicarbonate maybe and then carbon dioxide and water um, being released. So let's read this question, this answer B. Blood pH will initially drop, that's good. And as carbon dioxide and water reassociate or associate, pH will then rise. Well, if the carbon dioxide and the water associate into the bike into the carbonic acid, the carbonic acid will then dissociate into protons and bicarbonate. Okay, so that's going to make the situation worse because we're releasing more protons. We want the protons to go down. So this doesn't sound good. Let's look at C. Blood pH will initially drop. That's good. And that's protons and bicarbonate associate. So that sounds pretty good because it matches up with what, what we've got going on here. We've got these protons here associating with the bicarbonate. So that's good. The pH will increase. And so as the protons, as these protons kind of go away, because they're, they're associating with the, 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 the bicarbonate to produce the carbonic acid, and um, we get the carbon dioxide and water. That means that the proton concentration is going to uh, drop, which means the pH will increase. So that's that's good as well. So this C looks pretty pretty good. So we can eliminate B. Okay, last question. Nearly done now. Last question. Let's see what we got. Okay, so what's going on here? We're we're hyperventilating into a paper bag. Oh, this doesn't seem very smart. Don't do this. This doesn't seem like a good idea, um, but that's what you get. That's what that's what we've, that's the scenario we've got. What would you predict to be a predict? Now let's come back to that word to be a rapid but short-lived change to blood pH. So this is actually getting at this whole idea of 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 these fluctuations. So these fluctuations here, they're quick, they're rapid, 
but then they don't persist, so they're short-lived. So it's really asking, you know, what's what's happening in one of these rapid fluctuations? So let's kind of come back and and take a look at the question again. So we've got someone hyperventilating into a paper bag. So uh, here comes a really bad drawing. So here is um, here is a, a a paper bag. Okay, and there's someone blowing into it, so they're blowing in. Um, so um, they're blowing into it, and then they're sucking back in whatever they blow into it. And so they're doing this really, really fast. And so what's happening here? Um, well, as you exhale into the brown paper bag, you exhale some carbon dioxide, some oxygen, some, some other stuff, water vapor other gases and stuff. And then and then what happens? Well, then you inhale it back. And so you bring back these gases. And so you keep doing that. That's what the hyperventilating is. You keep you keep breathing this stuff in and out, in and out. Um, but what's going to happen to the oxygen level in here? Well the oxygen level is going to go down because when you take some oxygen into your blood into your body, you use the oxygen. You need the oxygen and so you metabolize the oxygen. Uh, but the, the carbon dioxide is a waste product. So the more you breathe into the bag, the concentration of carbon dioxide goes up and up and up. So the more you do this, the more you're going to end up with carbon dioxide in your blood. So that would, if you do this, is what happens is that the CO2 concentration in your blood goes way up. So what's going to happen to that whole blood buffering system if you just increase, if we increase this side, of that equation, which if you remember, it looked like this. It looks something like that. So if we increase this side, then we're going to drive the reaction over to the right. Okay, so when you drive the concentration of this up, of the carbon dioxide up, that means that the CO2 is much more likely to react with the water because there's more carbon dioxide, higher concentration. Um, so that means that the carbonic acid forms, and then we keep driving it to the right, and the proton concentration increases because the carbonic acid is acting as an acid. And so the proton concentration goes up. So in this situation, the proton concentration in your blood is going to go up. So what that means is the pH is going to drop. So there again is our answer. What does it match? pH would increase. No. Okay, there we go. pH would decrease. Okay, this is the part you have to think about. So you've got to think about what happens when you breathe in and out of a brown paper bag. Now you know that your body uses oxygen and releases carbon dioxide as a waste product. So if you just keep breathing back in that recycled air, all that's going to happen is you're going to keep taking oxygen out and putting in more and more and more carbon dioxide. And so the concentration of the carbon dioxide in the bag goes up and the concentration in your body of carbon dioxide must therefore go up. So we're driving this reaction from the left to the right, releases protons, proton concentration goes up, pH goes down. So that's where we get to this answer of pH would decrease from this pretty short question. So we can come up with all kinds of variations of this. Okay, so that kind of brings us to the end. We've talked about the chemistry of water. We led that into the electronegativity discussion. Um, talked about molecular polarity and how that gives rise to hydrogen bonding and then how hydrogen bonding accounts for the properties of water. And I didn't talk about all of the properties of water. I only talked about a few of the properties of water uh, and, and how those properties are exploited by biological systems. Then we talked a little bit about the, the concentrations of solutes, and we talked about pH and buffering. Is What I hope you see is that, is that one quite naturally leads to a discussion of two, and then the principles in two lead to three, and the principles in four. Um, and so then we really used our discussion of concentrations to frame our concentrations, uh, our discussions about pH and buffering. Okay, so that is it. Um, the answer to the question, how uh, what should I study, is, is, is well, not explained, but it's articulated in the learning outcomes. So uh, sometimes you will find the answers to the learning outcomes in these videos, in class, um, a quick Google search in some cases, or from readings. So no one thing will actually serve you uh, entirely.
So that's it. Um, that's the chemical basis of life. Next week we get into some organic chemistry. Uh, this week in co-curriculum I will spend uh, a lot of time really reviewing a lot of these principles because these are some very, very difficult principles and we will probably focus on doing some problems around the concentrations issues and around pH and buffering because those quantitative things are often challenging. Okay, that's it. I will see you next week.